Hello, everyone. Today I have with me Kelly Bissett Tom. She's the Director of Sovereign Ratings at Fitch. And Kelly's here to discuss the most recent um, ratings analyst report on, on Suriname, the ratings action that has taken place recently, and what's likely to, to, to happen in Suriname in the coming months and, year, and years. So, Kelly, without you know any any delay, let me switch straight to you and and ask you. I mean, in the report, I just want to quote one what you know a, a sentence that I want to ask a question on. So it says here first there was a downgrade. Then um, in the follow up report, it says Fitch upgrades the completion of the consent solicitation to reschedule the principal payments of Suriname's 2023 notes and amend the terms of the related accounts agreement. Um, so in very quick succession, we had a downgrade, we had um, um, this, this uh, uh, event taking place and then a revision to the rating. Could you walk us through what these ratings actions mean and what has driven this, this, um, this action from Fitch? Sure. The, the rating action, um, we've had three rating actions in July, uh, specifically on, on Suriname. This, uh, this is typical of a distressed debt uh, restructuring or event, as, as we call it under this criteria. Um, the first rating action uh, occurred on July 2nd when the government published its consent solicitation announcement, essentially to defer a principal payment that was due June 30th, and on which the government fell into uh, a 10-day grace period. Um, that consent solicitation it, effectively a, a request to creditors to amend the terms of the 2023 notes was obtained. Uh, so under our criteria, uh, this constitutes a distressed debt uh, restructuring for us. Um, and so we placed Suriname's uh, long-term foreign currency issue default ratings and the related note rating into uh, the, our default ratings restricted default for the issuer default rating and the note at B on the 13th of July. Um, we typically place the ratings into default for a few days uh, when we have such a uh, change in the, the terms of a note or an exchange of bonds uh, to mark the our credit history record, um, the default record. Um, and then we take the note, take the notes and the issuer default rating out of default um, a few days later. And that's what we did on the 16th. Mm -hmm. The exit rating uh, remains very low at double C, reflecting our expectation that um, a, a further broader debt restructuring is likely given early policy signals from the incoming uh, now, now new government um, that's currently formulating its own policy plans and firming up uh, its own uh, uh, po forward policies, um, as well as the, um, the economics and um, state of affairs with the, the, the deteriorated debt dynamics, acute external liquidity uh, shortage, um, and as well as other uh, distressed debt conditions and limited cash flows to the government that we all underline that the, 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 the tight position of public finances at the moment, uh, expectation that a broader uh, debt restructuring is, is very probable. Right. And, you know, Coming out of, I mean, so much has happened in Suriname in the last mm -hmm. few months, as you mentioned, a change in government after the former president has been in place for a few decades. Um, and I feel like, you know, unlike Guyana right next door where there's so much uncertainty, at least I think there, um, there is light at the end of the tunnel and, and, and a silver lining, if you will, for Suriname. Um, even though they're going through this debt restructure, and obviously they have some serious macroeconomic challenges ahead. Um, do you think there will be an IMF program in, in Suriname in, in the near future? The, the government's formulating its policy position, so we don't want to put words in their mouth, um, but we think uh, given their policy statements um, in that direction um, and references to um, the IMF, um, in various statements and early publications, um, including reference in the consent solicitation documentation. Um, we think that it's, it's fairly probable um, that they'll intend to seek one. Um, 
so yes, uh, we, we think that it's um, a fair, or we sign a fair probability to that. Um, but we think there's some uh, potential um, potholes along the way to, to yeah. implementing one. Um, the first IMF program in 2016 uh, went off track within the year, um, in part given some timing and, and sequencing challenges. Um, but we don't, we, we think that some of these fundamental um, channels and that just the degree of any major fiscal reform in any country um, get, can pose challenges, especially when um, the macro conditions are, are fairly weak. Um, and there's risk of from macro instability. So my next question, you know, if we, if, I also agree that it's likely there will be an IMF program. I think part of the reason why the one in 2016 got derailed was because they were able to successfully issue this bond that was oversubscribed, mm -hmm. and so that gave the government some liquidity. And I suppose, in in a sense, it temporarily solved the challenge that that, that they were going to the IMF for help for, mm -hmm. which is which is to finance uh, their deficit and, and help them get their finances back on track. But tell me your sense of what the policy implications would look like for Suriname under an IMF program. The last time there was an election and there was um, that IMF program, you know, soon after the election, there was a devaluation, for example. Um, mm -hmm. But there were also all, all kinds of other policy measures. What are you, what are your thoughts on what the policy measures might look like under um, if there is a, a, another IMF program now for Suriname? The implications of an IMF program really uh, have meaning on on two fronts. One, um, short term uh, stabilization for of uh, for macro conditions on the ground. Um, but also more longer to medium term um, institutional strengthening and um, that can potentially support um, institutions and break some of these uh, cyclical factors that contribute to instability periodically or, uh, over the medium term. On the short term, uh, one, of the, one of the foremost challenges is the, um, the current external imbalances with the exchange rate. Um, the, the parallel uh, market shows a hefty premium over the official rate. So adjusting those imbalances and aligning um, imports, um, import demand uh, with available foreign exchange um, is a key order of business. And then it, both existed before the coronavirus and the compression of oil prices, but that's an additional factor that's adding a degree of magnitude to the impending adjustment. Um, so, Doing that is in the, uh, one of the first orders of business for the new government, um, adjusting the exchange rate to uh, address the external imbalances with the exchange rate. We're expecting a devaluation this year given the very tight external liquidity. Headline reserves are uh, overall, or official reserves are over 500 million US dollars currently, but actual um, unrestricted, unrestricted reserves netting out commercial banks' uh, cash reserves um, under the uh, reserve requirements, are really close to closer to just over 100 million. So it's very limited for That's for an exchange, um, and there's additional tightness in the domestic market, domestic forex market, from limited U.S. dollar and euro inflows um, that existed pre-COVID. Um, those have been exacerbated um, by COVID and uh, from the fall off in some tourism and, and just international travel. Um, one factor contributing to the inflation that we we see on the ground, um, as well as some other shortages. But um, there's implications for the banks, uh, which which do have um, some foreign ex foreign currency lending, um, but not as much as in 2016, given tightening um, uh, policy controls on that front, um, with positive effect um, that have constrained new foreign currency lending. But um, having an IMF program in place certainly provides a degree of greater credibility and ex access to external, expectation of access to external liquidity post-evaluation um, that supports confidence in the financial system against any potential shocks on that front. Um, the other factor is just the expectations um, with creditors on policy reforms and clear benchmarks for a uh, 
fiscal policy adjustments, what reforms, what's timeline, which benchmarks, um, with regular reporting and, and an additional degree of transparency and credibility. Um, so those add credibility over the medium term, or sorry, over the near term for stabilization and some uh, potential debt res rescheduling or restructuring if, if the government uh, attempts that before the next uh, 2026 external coupon is due at the end of October um, and then the following one in, in December. Um, so that's kind of the timeline. If we do see restructuring, I think if, if they're targeting an IMF program, we could see announcements um, in the coming weeks potentially, um, again, but subject to to policy announcements. Right. So, I mean, you do mention um, in your report and just now about the institutional framework and the reforms that are likely, we know that there will be reforms under an IMF program if there is one. Um, you know, just could you walk us through your mm -hmm. assessment of the institutional framework from a pitch perspective? Because I personally mm -hmm. see you know the institutional framework and governance as really mm. critical um, factors in determining the not just the current socio-economic uh, environment in Suriname but the future socio-economic environment in Suriname. So if you can just walk through your assessment of of the institutional mm. framework for us and, mm -hmm. and and the implications on government governance, please. Maybe uh, present this in the framework of. Uh, some of the rating constraints. Uh, one of the key uh, constraints on the public finance side is um, the lack of cl clarity on the budget and budget credibility um, with spending controls, um, uh, clear projections on, on revenue um, that are uh, published in, in just a, a credible budget um, that's, that's with um, credible debate and forward analysis um, and presentation in the parliament. Um, that's a contrast even to some other single B range um, sovereigns. Um, certain arms done very well with commodity revenues over previous periods, um, but when things get very tight and you need a, a discussion about budgets um, and spending priorities, especially amid limited revenues, having a credible budget um, provides that de degree of um, credibility, but also um, uh, <laughs> clear thinking, if you will, in communication, especially with communication with external creditors um, and right. stakeholders as well. Um, another thing uh, is, in terms of just the institutional framework, is a more, more medium term thinking. Um, the Some uh, budgets that were presented previously, but not uh, thoroughly costed out um, uh, it matched with um, firm sources of financing had some medium term projections and there were there were clear steps taken towards that front but having clear macro projections and a medium term budget um, helps tie together future expectations with you know, the current uh, fiscal framework now um, other things that some other countries have done are have, have been adopt fiscal councils set a um, fiscal rule um, can be a nominal target um, uh, such as a percentage of GDP for an overall or primary deficit um, other things that other countries have done um, are set in this case um, not a debt ceiling um, Suriname does has a debt, debt ceiling but that's been um, uh, subject to waivers, definitional changes, um, and sharp upwards adjustment um, at the end of last year um, that has weakened its credibility uh, for external um, uh, analysts and uh, market participants. Um, so debt reduction targets um, is, is, is included in the current um, debt law, maybe more meaningful over the medium term. Um, but another factor that speaks to the structural factors for Suriname is, as well, the revenue sensitivity to commodity prices, given the large share of revenues, up, you know, up close to a third of revenues in um, particular years um, are derived from gold and oil. 
uh, which are very sensitive to international prices, as, we, as we've seen in Suriname and in other countries. So uh, savings frameworks have been adopted in uh, many other countries, especially, especially oil exporters um, that are sensitive to overnight changes in the oil price. Um, even in copper exporting countries like Peru and Chile, there's, there's saving fund, savings funds to offset um, mining cycles and when debt reaches a certain desirable level has provided counter cyclical policy capacity to both governments in, in periods of stress or where they view it necessary to smooth economic adjustment. Um, so those types of mechanisms can add medium term credibility um, over the medium term, but um, a key factor has to be a credible budget um, document, debate, and in publication um, post facto with transparency and timely reporting um, of, of those performance metrics um, that allows more mid-course correction as things progress to, to build credibility. Um, and all of that takes policy effort and um, institutional development and, and coordination. Thank you, Kelly. I hope, I, I mean, I really, really have high hopes for Suriname with this new government and with this, uh, these shifts in the policy uh, stance that we're seeing. Um, I really hope there is an IMF program and that their, their reforms will be successfully implemented in, 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 in a reasonable time frame. And I hope that um, you know, we can chat again when things start to improve for Suriname and, and they start being upgraded <laughs> again by Fitch. Uh, let's keep in touch and have a conversation when these things happen and as they progress. I thank you very much for, for sharing your analysis with us and your thoughts on, on how things are likely to progress for Suriname. Very much appreciated, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.